If you've seen any of my videos, either accidentally or on purpose, you're probably left thinking just one thing. This guy has got his finger on the pulse of cultural relevance. <laughs> well, thank you for noticing, first of all, and second, what can I say? It's true. I'm just so in tune with what the rest of the world is talking about these days. It's often one of the traits I credit when discussing how I achieved my cemented place on the cruise ship of YouTube. Granted, some have said this channel is more like a barnacle on the hull of that ship, but I'll let you be the judge after you see what hot-button topic I have in store for us to talk about today. Yum. 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 Is it too late to make this a beauty channel? I hear those are doing pretty well. CartoonNetwork.com. The Internet Cartoon. It's Flash Games, the lost but not forgotten snack food of gaming that, for many years, helped millions of curious kids navigate the daunting world of the internet by giving them something simple and fun to grasp onto. Being adaptable into nearly any shape or form, Flash Games were absolutely everywhere in the 2000s and early 2010s, to the point where entire websites were dedicated to hosting them, such as AddictingGames.com, Congregate, Armor Games, <laughs> my god, Newgrounds. If you were growing up during this time and had unchecked access to a computer, these sites are likely where you were spending a lot of your time. I could undoubtedly fill up several videos just talking about all kinds of different Flash games I remember playing from these. You might have had a regular gaming console for when it came to the real deal big boy games with fancy things like budgets and physics, but they didn't have Mario on a motorcycle, so were they even really trying? The first time you realized the sheer amount of Flash games there were to play online, it was like heading west and discovering a whole new frontier. Though one that had a lot of buffalo sh** to step over. It wasn't necessarily easy to make a high quality game within Flash, but it could certainly be done. And if you pulled it off, there was a massive audience of kids and teens ready to play your game, driving loads of traffic to your website. Who else do we know that would be interested in trafficked kids? Wait, I'm sorry, that, not, not exactly what I meant, uh, at least I, I think it's not. Why, it's cartoon channels, that's who. Speaking for myself, and probably quite a few people out there, when it came to these, it was the big three that would provide everything you needed for your viewing pleasure. Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and Disney Channel. Sure, there were other choices that had entertainment to offer, but with these three, it was like a beautiful cycle, as natural as the rain. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Oh! That being said, with this new internet thing tantalizing the youth with promises of free online games, these three networks, all of which having websites they'd want more people to come to, looked at their own catalogs of characters and presumably thought, well, we've got the brand recognition, let's hire some small teams of designers to churn out as many of these Flash games as we can host on our site, and all the kids will be trafficked right in. I feel like there is a better way to say that phrase. But therein lies this video, or should I say the next three videos. For the first time ever, I'm splitting an idea into a multi-parter. I figure it's best to put aside time for each website's game selection, giving me a chance to take in what they all have to offer when it came to handling their own properties with care, or lack thereof. While each one of these channels still hosts games on their respective website, they're no longer made with Flash and haven't been for a while. So I'm interested in revisiting the early attempts, the ones that weren't as strictly managed, and that personally hold quite a bit of nostalgia for me, along with making a few other stops to see ones I may have missed back then, whether or not that was a blessing in disguise. A trip to the past to have some fun and unlock long dormant memories of games that may be better or worse than we recall. So don't touch that dial, because it's time for Volume 1 of Saturday Morning Flash Games, starting with CartoonNetwork.com. These videos would certainly not have been possible to make without the help of NordVPN. Nah, nah, I'm kidding you. I'm not popular enough to have sponsors. No, I'm instead talking about the Flashpoint Archive. It's no big secret that support for Flash has been discontinued for a few years now, leaving all these classic games without a home and damning them to become lost media. Well, thanks to the team behind Flashpoint, led by Ben Lattimore, aka Blue Maxima, 
An absolute treasure trove of hits has been forever salvaged. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. There are hundreds of thousands of old Flash games available to play through a single download. So I'd recommend clearing your calendar because this is a rabbit hole you're going to be going down for a while. There's more than just Flash games on here too, and I was surprised to see stuff like the very first version of Minecraft be playable just in a click of a button. It's an awesome project that I'm sure took a lot of work to curate, and like I said, made making these videos a lot easier. So everyone say thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. All right, very nice. Well, to my previous point, there are a ton of games on here, and that includes everything made just for Cartoon Network, or the other two channels for that matter way more than I have time to realistically talk about. So I'll be sticking to a handful of shows that I feel have the most interesting selections of games, as well as a few notable miscellaneous crossover titles. If you finish this video and are disappointed I didn't get around to talking about Swami Shaggy, well, I apologize. But fear not, I've left a download link to Flashpoint in the description, so you can always go experience whatever game you had in mind for yourself. Okay, that's enough of the preamble. Let's get into the games, starting with one series that I feel had more than its fair share. Codename Kids Next Door had a fantastic concept for a cartoon, and one that seems like it would be quite easy to translate into game form. While actual video game releases for the show are surprisingly sparse, CartoonNetwork.com was certainly there to pick up the slack with their selection. They had a little bit of everything. Though for my money, the best of these are definitely the ones that make use of working as a team with the five main operatives. Protect and Swerve, for example, lets you swap between them on the fly to utilize each of their benefits. It's a racing game where you have to beat each bad guy to the end by driving over different types of terrain, some of which slow you down if you're not using the proper character for the job. Each kid you play as has their own health and ammo pool too, meaning you'll also need to swap them out if you've used one for offense too much. This leads to quite a natural sense of variety in the gameplay by incentivizing you to switch things up constantly. A lot of smart design going on here. It's something that can be said about Operation Graduates as well. It's a top-down space shooter that lets you build up firepower the more of your teammates you collect, but taking those upgrades away each time you receive damage. It's a concept that's obviously been done before, but for the purposes of an addictive flash game, it makes for a pretty engaging time. Up until this boss fight, which lets you do damage to it in a window of about 0.3 seconds before making you take down all of its weapons from the start again. Yuh. Keeping with the vehicles theme, we also have Downhill Derby and Operation Caked 4, two racing games that are somewhat similar to one another. Both let you pick between the five kids, each one having their own attributes. Though Downhill Derby sees you racing downhill at a speed that makes it just a wee bit difficult to see what obstacles are coming up ahead. Granted, I do think I picked a relatively fast character, and my now adult brain probably doesn't quite have the reaction time found within the nine-year-olds this was actually made for. If I was winning in this game, it was pure luck. Operation Caked 4 fixes things up a bit. Despite having a title that confused me so much, I had to Google why it's called that. Apparently, it's based on an episode that acts as the fourth entry in an ongoing cake-related saga. I guess I need to refresh myself on the things that actually happened in this show. What's a bra? And what's she training for? But anyway, the game sees the KND racing on water with their different rafts. Given the side view we have of the action this time, it's a lot easier to dodge what's coming. Though I was infinitely more amused by getting to cut off the other racers by swatting them away if they got too close. Get back there, you savages! That leads us to No Pee in the Ool, another water-related game where you control all of the kids at once, swapping between them on a dime to keep away from the adults who presumably do not want the kids peeing in the ool. Not sure I'm on the side they think I'm on here. I liked the idea of needing to basically juggle five different characters at one time and the challenges that arise from that, until I realized there doesn't seem to be any penalty for letting all but one get caught and just swimming around in circles until the timer runs out. Kind of breaking the game in half here, I guess. There's also these challenge races you can do that let you progress to the next level if you beat them. But I'm thinking I missed where it taught me how to move in these because after mashing every button I could, all I managed to do was swim about a foot before losing. After which the game literally told me my punishment was to continue playing it. Well, we'll see about that, huh? 
With these games, you definitely have to take the good with the bad, and I think it's time we delve a bit into the latter. Stuff like KND Codebreaker certainly isn't winning any awards. Being just an overly simplistic game of Simon with no music or sounds other than the repetitive buzz of the colors you need to hit, or I guess I should say, color, Really don't think we're getting the concept of Simon here, guys. Intruders in the Park wants you to complete five different missions to scare away all of the evil adults that have set up shop in the town's park. Each of these missions is a separate bite-sized minigame that ranges from decent enough to bad. Mission 3, for example, just has you shooting tennis balls at the park gardeners while the screen annoyingly sways up and down to artificially increase the difficulty. You know, guys, these people are just doing their jobs. Why do we need to physically assault them again? In fact, I know some of them are villains, but the kids next door don't exactly come off as super great here either. I mean, jeez, man, you're, you're really gonna hurt somebody. Though I do admit the hard cut to the pumped up theme song on the You Lose screen did get a laugh out of me for how tonally misplaced it was. Operation Startup is a bit more competent, though it isn't without its flaws. Each of the kids has their own level to platform through to collect the necessary MacGuffins and take down their respective villains. The game looks quite polished and plays just fine, though it might be a bit sluggish for my tastes. It's often that the place you need to go to or object you need to pick up is on a completely different floor from where you're currently at, meaning your very slow character now has to navigate out of the screen to painstakingly find the pathway to get there, which can certainly get a bit dull. Despite this, I do think the combination of light puzzle solving and platforming pairs up well with this series, making for one of the more recognizable games for it out of the bunch. In fact, Kids Next Door might have had among the widest variety of Flash games made for Cartoon Network.com out of all the shows of this era, including having some crossover titles under their umbrella as well, one of which being with the show that's next up on our list. The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy is very much a show that seemed to do whatever it wanted, whenever it wanted. It was impossible to predict where any given episode was going to go, making for an entertaining watch and an interesting canvas on which a distinct selection of Flash games were made. Operation Zero Out Mandied would be an entry that coincided with the Kids Next Door slash Billy and Mandy crossover episode released in 2007. I don't actually remember ever seeing this special on TV back when it aired, only learning about its existence later when seeing clips online. Though I'm glad it does exist, if only for the fact that it gave us this pretty fun little shooter game. You have a top-down view of Mandy, who needs to transform all of the elderly zombie operatives back into kids while also keeping them from expanding their ranks by infecting others. The gun you have will actually only stun them briefly, giving you an opening to aim a grenade toss that will cure whoever it lands on. As the difficulty rose, I found this to be an appealing gameplay loop for what it is, as well as getting somewhat hectic the more kids you need to defend. Being hectic isn't always a good thing, though, as evidenced by Big Top Billy. Here's a game that made me question my own sanity, a practice that became more and more commonplace with each passing hour I played all these. It's in the style of those old cannon shooting games where your goal was to set the high score by going the furthest distance. It wasn't the concept that confused me, I actually have a soft spot for those kinds of games. It was how to actually do what they were telling me I could do. According to the instructions, not only can you hit the space bar while in the air to get extra time, but Billy can grab these trapeze swings to avoid hitting the ground as well. Neither of these things seem to work. At least, not the way they claim to, because not only will Billy just not grab these trapeze no matter what, but hitting the space bar in the air doesn't seem to have an effect on anything. I gave it a good amount of tries, but I could never get very far because of these issues. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, but I found this to be a bit of a mess, and disappointingly so for the style it's going for. What's a good way to save face after doing a half-assed job at representing one genre? Do a half-assed job representing another genre. Billy the Kid just feels confused. With a setup like this, I would have bet I'd be seeing some kind of shooter game. However, that is not the case. It's a 2D fighter, which, to their credit, wasn't the easiest kind of game to make in Flash, what with all that pesky character balancing you'd need to deal with. But it's got everything a game like this should. A roster of characters, different stages, multiplayer. I really can't be too hard on it, with all things considered. It's kind of solid. Even if some of the outfits are a bit... uh, questionable. 
and that I can win most matches just by shoving the computer in a corner and spamming the same attacks until I chip away all their health, I just hope this gets an update before next year's Evo, or else the Billy the Kid fanbase will be all fired up and that's the last thing we want to see. Speaking of fire, let's throw Billy and the Puss Cookies in one. Here's the rundown, or actually, here's my personal interpretation, since the version of the game that was available to me wasn't in English. Billy needs to pop all of the constantly growing pimples on his face before they explode. Once you pop enough to fill the pus meter, I assume you'll have enough to make some pus cookies. Okay, somebody was arrested for this, right? I mean, it's not like the game itself is that bad, it's just a simple clicker game that gets progressively faster. But do I really need the visual of pus filling up a meter? Is this something kids would think is cool? I know the show didn't shy away from gross-out humor, but this is a bit much for even me. Also, sorry if you happen to be eating right now, I know this probably isn't the most appetizing visual. Pus meter. Okay, sorry, that maybe it is kind of funny. But let's shake off this childish nonsense and focus now on a game that should stimulate our adult brains with not only clever and compelling design, but enriching philosophical implications that have the potential to change the way we- Now oh, f*** it, it's fast and gassy. I don't remember what my life was like before playing this game, but I know I want it back. It's a rare Flash title that utilizes your microphone in order to work, having you move Baby Billy along the race by making fart sounds as loud as you can. Does it function? <laughs> What is my life? I think we get the idea. And by the way, that's actual sh**. The game is covered in sh**. And I'm not sure there's ever been a more appropriate visual metaphor. The selection hasn't been too ideal so far, so let's finish out these Billy and Mandy games with one that seems to be among the most memorable on the site. In fact, while looking into these Cartoon Network Flash games, Harem Scarum kept appearing near the top of everyone's lists in terms of ones that stuck with them the most. Can't say that I'm any different, I remember playing it too. It's got a very inviting feel to it, a simple 2D platformer where you can swap between Billy and Mandy and use a variety of weapons to take down all of the evil pumpkins. This was one of the games I had to remind myself to move on from, because I started getting into just playing through it naturally. It does have a little bit of jankiness to it though. Not every weapon is as good as the next, and swapping between the characters has a strange delay to it if you aren't standing perfectly still. Other than that, the difficulty is tight and the controls are decent. But man, we maybe could have chopped the boss health in half because these things take so long to bring down, I thought I was doing something wrong. Regardless, I had fun with this game. Even if it forgets the cardinal rule of the series being that Mandy can never smile. Ooh, that's gonna be one demerit. If you've been paying attention, it's because you're a nerd with nothing better to do. Our next show may not have had as many games made for it as the others, but the ones it does have certainly prove that the quality over quantity rule applied here. What show is it, you probably don't ask? Why, it's... Oh yeah, here comes the action. Teen Titans continues to be one of the most beloved cartoons to come out of the network, as well as being one of the highest rated superhero shows ever. I'll be honest though, it was a bit harder to find games for it since the more comedy themed Teen Titans Go has its own selection that vastly outnumbered the original series. I have no personal vendetta against Go, it was a little after my time and superhero stuff has always been reinterpreted in different styles so that never bothered me. But it did make it roughly 4% harder to find what I need, so I have to hate it now. Listen, irrational disliking of things for minor inconveniences is just a part of getting older. That, taking pills, and squinting are kind of the trifecta. But why think about my mortality when Teen Titans Titanic Ambush is fun? In World, the idea seems a bit silly. Like, why would the characters ever be standing stationary back to back like this? But it really comes together in the gameplay. Each Titan fires their weapon in a different pattern, making them all useful for dealing with enemies depending on their position. You can spin the team around as needed and attack individually or all at once, with Raven providing a shield to protect from the bigger threats. Beast Boy is relegated to a special move you can charge up that acts as a screen nuke as well. It takes a little time to get used to how to play, but once you get in the swing of it, it's hard to stop. And I think they were really onto something here. I'm always a bit weary of Flash games that offer five different games in one. With these being small already, dividing them down even further seems like a recipe for some pretty shallow experiences. 
One-on-one, -on -one, however, is proud to show me just how wrong I was, offering five games that each feel like they could have easily been sold on their own. You play as every member of the Teen Titans, facing off against their nemeses, mostly their endurance rounds, having you outlast the timer and take on a boss at the end. Ravens is definitely the standout one, though. The idea of grabbing the falling rocks out of the air to bash them into one another is really clever, and it's not something I can say I've seen done before. Unfortunately, though, I wasn't too impressed with Beast Boy's level, being the only traditional platformer out of the bunch. Nothing's wrong with the gameplay, per se, letting you swap between animals for separate movement styles. But, for whatever reason, the version of the game I played on Flashpoint zipped right by the instruction screen that tells you how to play. I tried restarting the program several times, but the screens only show up for about a frame before disappearing. The other four were simple enough to understand, but I'm definitely missing something here because I have no idea what they want me to do to get past these robots without losing a life. I'm hitting every button I can think of, but no dice. If you've played this game before and know what I'm doing wrong, please let me know and I promise I'll make a follow-up to this video concluding my thoughts on Beast Boy's level I'm Lying Don't Bother. I've got one more Teen Titans game to talk about today, and boy is it a doozy. Apparently, a lot of people played and remember it. It being Battle Blitz. We're back in the 2D fighting game genre, but this time it's much more cleaned up compared to other attempts. Battle Blitz trims off any possible fat and delivers exactly what it sets out to do. Ten different characters are playable between the good guys and the bad guys, each with their own special moves to try out. The characters look great, the animations look great, it feels good to play, it's multiplayer, it's just an impressive Flash game. And while I'm sure this isn't showing up on any best fighting games of all time list, it still goes far beyond what it needed to. And that's something I can say about all these Teen Titans games. I don't know what it was about this show in particular, but it really ushered in a consistent stream of quality with its interactive counterparts, perhaps more so than any other show I've looked at. While the pool to choose from may have been comparatively smaller, the bar has certainly been raised. So let's see if our next show can live up to it. Being just a touch different in tone from the often melancholy and action-packed Teen Titans, Ed, 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 Ed and Eddie was a major pillar of Cartoon Network's lineup, and amongst my favorites to ever come out of the channel. That being said, it was only natural it would have a heavy presence on their website. One thing came to mind when imagining what they could do for Flash games involving the Eds. Scams. I mean, what else, right? I wonder which ones they turned into games. It could have been so many with how far-fetched and ridiculous the show could get. I bet it was difficult to narrow down which one would make the best playable, or they could just make it Beyblade, that's fine. Spin Stadium leaves me somewhat speechless. The game itself is fine. All you need to do is rack up combos by knocking out the other spinning tops, and that's literally it. Nothing's wrong with a simple little game like this, but why did it have to be Ed, Ed, and Eddie themed? When did they ever do this in the show? I feel like you could have just as well put any cartoon's coat of paint over Spin Stadium and it would have worked all the same. So I guess they had to pick someone to use for this peach of an idea. I was starting to get more of a vibe they understood the show when it came to Eds Over Heels, a series of multitasking mini-games starring the Eds who are all trying to impress Naz with their skills. Naz being apparently pretty hard to please when it comes to acts of physical dexterity. I'd be pretty honored if someone did even one of these tricks for me and she's just over here yawning. Maybe this isn't the most stable foundation on which to build a relationship, but to build a fun little game, sure. And that's what's really more important in the end anyway, I think. Okay, we're starting to feel more like Ed, Ed and Eddie with these. Clash of the Idiots has some nice slapstick that the series is known for, but outside of that, I don't think I really get it. You're Double D fighting one of the Kanker sisters, which works fine as a premise, but to activate your moves, you need to basically build your deck before each round to decide what order you'll do them in. The problem is, your opponent is doing the same thing, and you have no way of knowing what they'll pick in order to counter it. You just have to get lucky. So this pretty much turns into a bizarro form of rock-paper-scissors, where the most interesting aspect of it is how into this shoulder massage Eddie seems to be. Perhaps the greatest scam of all was hiding our true feelings, huh? Let's go for a double feature now with Cul-de-Sac Smash 1 and 2. Wow, a sequel. Don't see many of those around these parts. Guess that must mean these were pretty popular. I can kind of see why. It's bumper carts, with an appealing presentation and a good amount of unlockable content, including different derbies, characters, and carts. This clearly took some effort, and the main gameplay loop is pretty fun. 
It is satisfying to get some chunky hits in on the others, but when the arena is down to just mano a mano, you versus one other computer player, it's almost impossible for you two to actually hit each other. I guess they mapped the CPU to move whenever the player moves or something? There's a weirdness going on here that got pretty frustrating to deal with. I just want to bumper my cart. Why is hitting this person as hard as swatting a gnat with a toothpick? Thankfully, this was remedied a touch within the second game, which is pretty much the same thing, just with the added bonus of giving each character their own special move that can level the playing field. Where I couldn't even finish one round in the first entry, I ended the match before even realizing what happened in the second. Funny how much of a difference one change can make. Update patches were not exactly an option back then, so if you had something you wanted to add to your Flash game after the fact, might as well build a sequel just to include that one feature, even if it's 98% the same game. <laughs> what a foreign concept compared to sequels these days, right? <laughs> right? Here's another that caught my eye. Infect Ed, the Tainted Jawbreaker. You see, Ed ate a bad jawbreaker, and now one of his white blood cells needs to fight off the invading germs inside his body. Now you might think, huh, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Just feels like they slapped the brand on here to get more people to play what was clearly a weird little white blood cell game they had lying around. Well, to that I say, how dare you? Because I was just about to say that. Why was it so difficult to make Ed, Ed, and Eddie games about Ed, Ed, and Eddie? Was this show just their go-to for when it came to shoehorning in concepts that didn't have a home anywhere else? Oh, I almost forgot to mention how the game actually was. It's fine. I'd much rather be playing something like Lunchroom Rumble, though. It's your standard arena game with a food fight twist. Jumping right into the fray makes it a bit difficult to tell what's going on, but if you camp the health pickups at the corners of the screen, you should pretty much win by default. Though I should mention the reason really anybody has remembered this game since is because it's the only time we've ever seen Double D actually take off his hat. His victory animation shows him tossing it up, revealing a pretty normal head of hair though this was ultimately considered to not be canon. Good thing, too, because one of the show's longest-running gags was the mystery surrounding what Double D looked like without the hat on. To just make it a regular-looking head really shows a lack of understanding of the show's humor, or a major part of a main character's personality. Now, am I overanalyzing a piece of nearly forgotten media from 15 years ago? Well, allow me to take this opportunity to introduce you to the channel if you're new around here. That's just about all the Ed, Ed, and Eddie I think I need for one day. But I did want to give an honorary mention to Crack Eds, which, after I beat, offered me a free Ed, Ed, and Eddie backpack. Let's just say the next time you see me, I'll be living large. We've got time to highlight one more show, so let's see who's up next. Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends wouldn't have been my first guess for shows that had quite a bit of quality Flash games made for them. Not to say it had no potential, but I guess I just have a hard time seeing a ton of opportunities to translate this setting and characters into game form. Well, believe it or not, I was wrong. Because next to Teen Titans, Foster's probably has the most clean collection of games tied to it. Might have something to do with the fact that it's technically the newest show out of all the ones we're looking at. And even though it's only by about a year or so, that still gives the crack team of Cartoon Network Flash game developers more time to have honed their craft. And as a result, we get to have games like A Friend in Need. Your goal is to toss Blue back and forth to keep him away from this bratty little girl who wants to adopt him, all while waiting for Mac to hustle his way over to Foster's to put a stop to the whole charade. There's three different throwing options for when you hurl Blue to the other characters, being short, medium, and far. Once you get the hang of which choice to use when, it can get pretty fun to rack up those high scores by waiting until the absolute last second to make the pass. And yes, keeping potential happiness away from a child feels just as sweet as ever. I noticed that a lot of these Foster's games must have either been made by the same team or around the same time, because there's a very similar art direction within a good chunk that I played. Guess the quality control was starting to crank it up a notch. Coco's Egg Scramble being one that continues that theme by being another simple yet entertaining little novelty. You play as Mac shooting baseballs up in the air to open Coco's eggs before they hit the ground. If they do manage to land, the bar Coco is standing on lowers down a bit, making it harder and harder. It's all about collecting the toys that come out of the eggs for maximum points, and this certainly would have been a game I'd have sat around playing for hours had I been aware of it as a kid. I know this for a fact, because that's exactly what I did with Mid-Flight Snack. 
Eduardo, Mac, and Blue are on a seesaw of sorts that launches them up in the air to collect all the floating food. The challenge of the game is aiming to collect enough in a row to keep your combo up and get the highest score before the energy meter runs out, which you can replenish as long as you keep collecting enough snacks. Man, this one's good too. We're having a pretty clean sweep with quality games for this show so far, aren't we? Guess there's only one thing left for us to do now. Let's ruin that. The aptly named Utter Nonsense is yet another microphone-centered game that at least is less fecal-centric this time. Picture playing the vocals on Rock Band, but instead of needing to hit the notes of your favorite song, you have to replicate Cheese's oh-so-funny catchphrases as best you can. Bonnie! Mm, try again. What the f***? Dignity be damned, I gave it my best shot. But all I could think of after playing was how sorry I felt for the ears of any parents whose kids happen to really enjoy this game. Well, after all that noise, let's cool things down a bit with the tranquil outer space trace, which I found to be a very pleasant time. You have to connect the stars by tracing a line to a new one constantly before it fades out, creating constellations out of the shapes you make, what is otherwise a pretty calming game can get a little feverish when you've got a high combo going and are trying to keep moving as fast as you can before it cuts you off. Which can happen in about half a second if you haven't gotten to another star in time. Very creative, but maybe lacking a sense of extreme attitude. Luckily, Jump and Grind Remix is here to satiate our needs. I'm surprised it took me this long to get to a skateboard game. Guess I could have done much worse. You can pick between four characters and your choice of board to try your hand at three different styles of riding. Racking up the points and letting your speed gradually get higher can lead to a pretty intense time. Well, okay, maybe intense isn't the right word. I mean, even when you crash, your character doesn't even change their facial expression. As far as arbitrary skateboard games go, I guess I can say this one is quite literally the dictionary definition of being more than nothing. I had an unspoken rule that I was probably going to skip over any character designer or random name generator game I found since they're pretty much all the same thing. However, with Fosters being a show actually about making up imaginary beings, I guess I can make an exception and talk about Gallery of Imagination. I mean, it is exactly what you'd expect, letting you pick from a selection of different body parts and colors to design your ideal imaginary friend, but the sheer amount of customization options took me a bit by surprise. Despite not really being my kind of game, I have to say this is probably about as good as you can make a character designer Flash game back in the day. There's a lot of room for originality, so kudos for holding my attention. A bar that is being lowered more and more with each passing minute. I think I can confidently say that out of all the shows I've looked at for Cartoon Network, Foster's probably had the highest quality selection overall. But we're still not quite done, because Cartoon Network.com also hosted numerous crossover games featuring a ton of popular shows in one, and I feel our trip through this catalog wouldn't be complete without covering the most noteworthy of these ensemble pieces. So let's start with what is probably some of the oldest, if not THE oldest games that have ever been put up on the site. Cartoon Cartoon Summer Resort features the elitist society of cartoons living it up on their own private island, perhaps engaging in some probably not legal activities that they wouldn't want the general public to be privy to. Look at them. Look at them living it up. In all honesty though, because of this game's age, we have some of the best sprites of these cartoon characters I have ever seen. I cannot get over their giant heads at awkward proportions. I just think they're adorable. If they ever sold official merchandise depicting these characters like this, I would buy the whole set, and I mean that sincerely. Interestingly enough, the game was split into four playable episodes that each put you in control of a different character who starred in their own animated short from the Cartoon Cartoon Fridays block. I guarantee I never would have heard of or seen these characters otherwise if not for these games, so this was kind of a cool way to have their legacy immortalized. All four episodes see you doing pretty much the same thing, walking around and talking to the vacationing cartoons to see what they have going on, and being tasked with finding objects around the resort that they're asking for. Gameplay-wise, yeah sure, it can get pretty mundane running errands for everybody, but the charm of the visuals and dialogue balances it out for the most part. There's somewhat of an overarching plot, too, with the first episode being about you fixing the pool, the second being you disarming one of Dexter's rogue robots, the third being about literally saving everyone from an active erupting volcano. Then the fourth is about helping people find partners for the disco dance party. Got a little severe there in the third episode, didn't we? Well, regardless, these are hard not to love. 
and are good for a quick romp if you've got the patience for it, and also enjoy hearing that cartoon bonk sound every single time you walk up against a wall. I am so glad to say that they got their money's worth out of these sprites, because we get to see them used again in the two sister games, Kick the Can and Beanbag Tag. These two are nearly the same game, but with just enough differences to be justified. And I honestly prefer them over Summer Resort. I mean, really, who needs this much money? Let's see those tax returns, people. In Beanbag Tag, your character is it, which means you just have to tag all of the other scurrying cartoons and make them freeze to win the round. Freeze in this sense, meaning to actually encase them in a block of ice. Ugh, why are these games so charming? If one of the characters touches another that you already froze, they'll unfreeze and be able to run around again, making it a bit tricky when you've got them all over the map, but fun nonetheless. In Kick the Can, it's a more traditional game of tag where you just need to touch the others to freeze them, but if one of them manages to kick the titular can, everyone unfreezes. You can also kick the can yourself and play more defensively by shoving it into a corner and standing guard against anyone who tries to touch it. Get away. Get away, it's mine. I just really enjoyed everything about these two games, even down to the little things, like how they're meant to be just a bored group of kids looking for something to do. Then you have grown-ass man Johnny Bravo playing along with the rest of them like it isn't weird at all. As much as I can't get enough of these dinky-looking characters, I do have to admit that The Envelopes, Please stands out as probably the best-looking game on the website. It's the night of the big award ceremony for all the cartoons, but all of the envelopes containing the winners' names have gone missing. You play as IR Baboon, who's tasked with searching the premises for all ten by talking to the other cartoons and solving mini-puzzles. It's conceptually similar to Summer Resort in some ways, though because the environment is a lot more condensed, it goes by much quicker. While I do think this is a good time, I'm wondering why anybody would need to beat this more than once. After you know where to find every envelope, whether it be from doing someone a favor or just perusing the shrubbery, doesn't that pretty much negate ever really needing to play again? I mean, what am I? Some bored kid online who likes to play the same thing over and over to enjoy all of my favorite characters interacting? Ah, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to understand the appeal now. This aesthetic is so pristine for being a Flash game. I could have been convinced this was on something like the Game Boy Advance by the looks of it, and while I do think this might be the top of the heap in terms of visuals and style, Trick or Treat Beat is probably the best game in general, and the final one we'll talk about today. Yes, this video will eventually end. I know I criticized other games for not really being on theme, and with Trick or Treat Beat, the only thing really tying it to Cartoon Network at all are the cardboard cutout characters that are just standing around, but man is this nicely put together. It's Halloween, and you're a trick-or-treater who needs to collect all of the coins and candy in each level within the time limit to progress to the next. Depending on which costume you're using, you can utilize different abilities to find more goodies and scour each stage for secrets. It's straightforward, just difficult enough to still be engaging, creative, and has plenty of levels to keep you occupied for a good amount of time. I honestly can't think of any aspect about this I don't like. To me, it's the quintessential Flash game experience, and the perfect note to end a probably much longer than it needs to be, journey through Cartoon Network's collection. I know that felt like a lot of games, but those were just the ones I had time to talk about today. I made many more stops and tried roughly hundreds of these just so I could get a proper reminder of what it was like to skim through the site back then. And like the channel itself, there seemed to be such a sense of community and appreciation for these cartoons that echoed through each title. Sure, some felt a little cynical or cheaply made, but even ones I think missed the mark still had something to appreciate about them, or at the very least, discuss. And I think for that reason, they'll always be endearing to me no matter how much time has passed. CartoonNetwork.com definitely had what it took to be a worthwhile stop on a curious kid's journey across the internet, and having been one of those kids myself, I'll never stop getting a kick out of seeing these funky little distractions again. Please, just, just make a plush out of him or something. I'll buy five, I'm begging you. With many more Flash games on the horizon for me, I'm looking forward to what the other channels may have done differently when it came to how they approached this niche little corner of their brand, even if I'm likely to lose my mind in the process. Oh, let's just call it a work expense. So, did I manage to convince you guys that I am culturally relevant, and that this topic really is one that everyone's going to be talking about? No! Ah. I see. Well, uh, well, I, I have two more of these coming, so...
guess I'll see you in the next one.